Welcome to our new lecture video about liquid liquid extraction equipment. This is your host Rose, presenting to you today in behalf of Chemical Engineering Philippines. This video is a narration of the extraction equipment written in the Chemical Engineering Unit Operations book written by Mac Cave, Smith and Harriet. We created this content to help you in your studies. According to scientific studies, learning is more efficient if reading is accompanied by audio support. So, without further ado, let us jump into our featured topic. Extraction equipment may be operated batchwise or continuously. A quantity of feed liquid may be mixed with a quantity of solvent in an agitated vessel, after which the layers are settled and separated. The extract is the layer of solvent plus extracted solute, and the raffinate is the layer from which solute has been removed. The extract may be lighter or heavier than the raffinate, and so the extract may be shown coming from the top of the equipment in some cases and from the bottom in others. The operation may of course be repeated if more than one contact is required, but when the quantities involved are large and several contacts are needed, continuous flow becomes economical. Most extraction equipment is continuous with either successive stage contacts or differential contacts. Representative types are mixer settlers, vertical towers of various kinds that operate by gravity flow, agitated tower extractors, and centrifugal extractors. The characteristics of various types of extraction equipment are listed in Table 20.2. Liquid-liquid extraction can also be carried out using porous membranes as described in Chapter 26. The method has promise for difficult separations. Let us first discuss about the mixer settler equipment. For batch-wise extraction, the mixer and settler may be the same unit. A tank containing a turbine or propeller agitator is most common. At the end of the mixing cycle, the agitator is shut off, the layers allowed to separate by gravity, and extract and raffinate drawn off to separate receivers through a bottom drain line carrying a sight glass. The mixing and settling times required for a given extraction can be determined only by experiment, 5 minutes for mixing and 10 minutes for settling are typical, but both shorter and much longer times are common. For continuous flow the mixer and settler are usually separate pieces of equipment. The mixer may be a small agitated tank provided with inlets and a draw-off line and baffles to prevent short-circuiting or it may be a motionless mixer or other flow mixer. The settler is often a simple continuous gravity decanter. With liquids that emulsify easily and have nearly the same density it may be necessary to pass the mixer discharge through a screen or pad of glass fiber to coalesce the droplets of the dispersed phase before gravity settling is feasible. For even more difficult separations, tubular or disc type centrifuges are employed. If as is usual, several contact stages are required, a train of mixer settlers is operated with countercurrent flow, as shown in figure 20.5 the raffinate from each settler becomes the feed to the next mixer, where it meets intermediate extract or fresh solvent. The principle is identical with that of the continuous countercurrent stage leaching system shown in figure 17.3. Next in our list is the spray and pack extraction towers. These tower extractors give differential contacts, not stage contacts, and mixing and settling proceed simultaneously and continuously. In the spray tower shown in figure 20.6, the lighter liquid is introduced at the bottom and distributed as small drops by the nozzles A. The drops of light liquid rise through the mass of heavier liquid, which flows downward as a continuous stream. The drops are collected at the top and form the stream of light liquid leaving the top of the tower. The heavy liquid leaves the bottom of the tower. In figure 20.6, light phase is dispersed and heavy phase is continuous. This may be reversed, 
and the heavy stream sprayed into the light face at the top of the column, to fall as dispersed face through a continuous stream of light liquid. The choice of dispersed face depends on the flow rates, viscosities, and wetting characteristics of both faces and is usually based on experience. The face with the higher flow rate may be dispersed to give a greater interfacial area, but if there is a significant difference in viscosities, the more viscous face may be dispersed to give a higher settling rate. Some say that in packed towers the continuous face should wet the packing, but this need not be true for good performance. Whichever face is dispersed, the movement of drops through the column constantly brings the liquid in the dispersed face into fresh contact with the other face to give the equivalent of a series of mixer settlers. There is continuous transfer of material between phases, and the composition of each face changes as it flows through the tower. At any given level, of course, equilibrium is not reached, indeed, it is the departure from equilibrium that provides the driving force for material transfer. The rate of mass transfer is relatively low compared to distillation or absorption, and a tall column may be equivalent to only a few perfect stages. In actual spray towers, contact between the drops and the continuous phase often appears to be most effective in the region where the drops are formed. This could be due to a higher rate of mass transfer in the newly formed drops or to back mixing of the continuous phase. In any case, adding more height does not give a proportional increase in the number of stages. It is much more effective to redisperse the drops at frequent intervals throughout the tower. This can be done by filling the tower with packing, such as rings or saddles. The packing causes the drops to coalesce and reform and, as shown in Table 20.2, may increase the number of stages in a given height of column. Pack towers approach spray towers in simplicity and can be made to handle almost any problem of corrosion or pressure at a reasonable cost. Their chief disadvantage is that solids tend to collect in the packing and cause channeling. Let us now talk about the perforated plate towers. Redispersion of liquid drops is also done by transverse perforated plates like those in the sieve plate distillation tower described in Chapter 17. The perforations in an extraction tower are 11 to 4 mm in diameter. Plate spacings are 150 to 600 mm or 6 to 24 inches. Usually the light liquid is the dispersed phase, and downcomers carry the heavy continuous phase from one plate to the next. As shown in figure 20.8a, light liquid collects in a thin layer beneath each plate and jets into the thick layer of heavy liquid above. A modified design is shown in figure 20.8b, in which the perforations are on one side of the plate only, alternating from left to right from one plate to the next. Nearly all the extraction takes place in the mixing zone above the perforations, with the light liquid rising and collecting in a space below the next higher plate, then flowing transversely over a weir to the next set of perforations. The continuous phase heavy liquid, the solvent, passes horizontally from the mixing zone to a settling zone in which any tiny drops of light liquid have a chance to separate and rise to the plate above. This design often greatly reduces the quantity of oil carried downward by the solvent and increases the effectiveness of the extractor. Before we proceed with the other liquid liquid extraction equipment, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click on the notification bell so you will be updated in all of our posts. And now we have the baffle towers. These extraction towers contain sets of horizontal baffle plates. Heavy liquid flows over the top of each baffle and cascades to the one beneath, light liquid flows under each baffle and sprays upward from the edge through the heavy face. The most common arrangements are disc and donut baffles and segmental, or side-to-side, -side, baffles. In both types, the spacing between baffles is 100 to 150 millimeters. 
Baffle towers contain no small holes to clog or be enlarged by corrosion. They can handle dirty solutions containing suspended solids. One modification of the Discan Donut towers even contains scrapers to remove deposited solids from the baffles. Because the flow of liquid is smooth and even, with no sharp changes in velocity or direction, baffle towers are valuable for liquids that emulsify easily. For the same reason, however, they are not effective mixers, and each baffle is equivalent to only a 0.05 to 0.1 ideal stage. Next we have the agitated tower extractors. Mixer settlers supply mechanical energy for mixing the two liquid phases, but the tower extractors so far described do not. They depend on gravity flow both for mixing and for separation. In some tower extractors, however, mechanical energy is provided by internal turbines or other agitators, mounted on a central rotating shaft. In the rotating disc contactor shown in figure 20.9a, flat discs disperse the liquids and impel them outward toward the tower wall, where stator rings create quiet zones in which the two faces can separate. In other designs, sets of impellers are separated by combing sections to give, in effect, a stack of mixer settlers one above the other. In the York Scheibel extractor illustrated in figure 20.9b, the regions surrounding the agitators are packed with wire mesh to encourage coalescence and separation of the phases. Most of the extraction takes place in the mixing sections, but some also occurs in the coming sections, so that the efficiency of each mixer settler unit is sometimes greater than 100%. Typically each mixer settler is 300 to 600 mm high, which means that several theoretical contacts can be provided in a reasonably short column. The problem of maintaining the internal moving parts, however, particularly where the liquids are corrosive, may be a serious disadvantage. Let us now move to pulse towers. Agitation may also be provided by external means, as in a pulse column. A reciprocating pump called pulses, the entire contents of the column at frequent intervals, so that a rapid reciprocating motion of relatively small amplitude is superimposed on the usual flow of the liquid phases. The tower may contain ordinary packing or special sieve plates. In a packed tower the pulsation disperses the liquids and eliminates channeling, and the contact between the phases is greatly improved. In sieve plate pulse towers the holes are smaller than in non-pulsing towers, ranging from 1.5 to 3 mm in diameter, with a total open area in each plate of 6 to 23% of the cross-sectional area of the tower. Such towers are used almost entirely for processing highly corrosive radioactive liquids. No downcomers are used. Ideally, the pulsation causes light liquid to be dispersed into the heavy face on the upward stroke and the heavy face to jet into the light face on the downward stroke. Under these conditions, the stage efficiency may reach 70%. This is possible, however, only when the volumes of the two phases are nearly the same and when there is almost no volume change during extraction. In the more usual case, the successive dispersions are less effective, and there is backmixing of one phase in one direction. The plate efficiency then drops to about 30%. Nevertheless, in both pack and sieve plate pulse columns the height required for a given number of theoretical contacts is often less than one-third that required in an unpulsed column. And now we have the centrifugal extractors. The dispersion and separation of the phases may be greatly accelerated by centrifugal force, and several commercial extractors make use of this. In the Podbilniak extractor a perforated spiral ribbon inside a heavy metal casing is wound about a hollow horizontal shaft through which the liquids enter and leave. Light liquid is pumped to the outside of the spiral at a pressure between 3 and 12 atmosphere to overcome the centrifugal force. Heavy liquid is fed to the center. 
The liquids flow countercurrently through the passage formed by the ribbons and the casing walls. Heavy liquid moves outward along the outer face of the spiral, light liquid is forced by displacement to flow inward along the inner face. The high shear at the liquid-liquid interface results in rapid mass transfer. In addition, some liquid sprays through the perforations in the ribbon and increases the turbulence. Up to 20 theoretical contacts may be obtained in a single machine, although 3 to 10 contacts are more common. Centrifugal extractors are expensive and find relatively limited use. They have the advantages of providing many theoretical contacts in a small space and of very short hold-up times, which is about 4 seconds. Thus they are valuable in the extraction of sensitive products such as vitamins and antibiotics.